There have, as we probably all know, been many great scientists. 10, you probably 20. Knew this. Uh, at, at least. Einstein, Newton. Uh, How many is many? I don't know. I don't know. Lots. That, lots of good scientists. Look, and some are more famous than others. So you've, you've mentioned a couple already. Like You've heard of Einstein. You've heard of Newton. You've heard of Marie Curie. Yes, there was a lady who was famous. Yes, good, good. I, I know. Um, maybe you've heard of Satyendra Nath Bose. Have you heard of him? Uh, I want to say maybe. I want to say I've got a, I've got a, a weird feeling in my mind. Is he like the best mathematician, like child mathematician genius at the age of one? I want to say yes, but I don't know. He, he's oh. but you, you've heard his name because he, he's a he's he found out a whole bunch of weird stuff about photons, and he's the Bose and Bose Einstein condensate. Oh, okay, and stuff yeah, like all right. Probably should have heard of him. Well, I hadn't heard of him. I'd heard his name. I suppose that's a start. Um, what about Jocelyn Bell Burnell? No, I got nothing. Uh, so post-grad in 1967, she was she co-discovered the first radio pulsars. Hey, hey yeah, that's so, cool. That's cool. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. And that, that's been credited as one of the most significant scientific achievements of the 20th century. Is it really? Well, someone said it, so it's got to be true. I've read it. Uh, look, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think I think well, they kind of proved they weren't aliens, so thanks. Yeah, look, it's a good one. It's a good one, but you know, uh, relativity is big there. Making electricity get out to everyone, the internet—that's pretty cool. Um, I like anesthetics. Anesth oh, yeah, the medical stuff. Yeah, public health. I like them recreationally, though. I don't really care for them in surgeries. <laughs> Recreational anesthetics. Oh hell yeah! What are you gonna do? Uh, pass out. I just I just um, gotta say, yeah. if if someone was asking me what are the top ten uh, scientific discoveries or things of the twentieth century, pulsars cool as they are, uh, might not make it into that list. You just hate women, man. That's no, obvious. I, you, oh, <laughs> you're verbaling me there. You're verbaling me. <laughs> so then you got, um, you've heard of Barry Marshall, you know, the guy who did his self-experimentation to reveal that bacteria cause ulcers, not worry, curry and hurry. I, I do have heard of him. You do have heard of him? Yeah, Nobel Prize. What about? Him. Okay. Yeah, you, you got a Nobel, a, a Nobel or a Nobel. It's hard to tell. Just ask Donald. What about uh, one of the most uh, heavily ignored scientists of all, Alfred William Lawson? Mm, uh, driver's dog. No, well, he was he was uh, he was a man who, according to at least one source I read, uh, I'm quoting here, gave mankind the true base from which to start an edifice of super knowledge of the universe and its laws. Okay, cool, cool. Because edifice of super knowledge. Here we go. Welcome to The Wholesome Show, the edifice of science communication podcast for people who sit up the back of the classroom. In which we ask the stupid, crazy, ridiculous and downright pointless questions so that you, dear listener, do not have to. We do the hard work for you, listener. God, we do the hard work. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant, and... And me, Dr. Roderick Griffin Lamberts. And I'd also like to, you know, say a big hooray to mark the 650th anniversary of the invention of the tea towel. Is it really? Sure. Oh, please don't tempt me like that. I. <laughs> You're like, this is the best day! Tea towels are right! I, 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 I can't quite believe that the tea towel would have been written down as a date when it was invented. But of course, there was there was a date in which tea towels did exist, didn't exist, and then suddenly they did. So there was a moment, surely. Yes, and oh. this is it, 650 years ago today. The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. And yes. tea towels? Or... And tea towels. And of um, Alfred William Lawson. So, Will, you're going to get up the back and get comfy. I can see that you are. I'm wrapped in tea towels. I'm here to go. I want to know about this edifice of super knowledge. Oh, yeah, edifice... Oedipus. I think the best way to introduce the episode would be to call it Alfred William Lawson, A Life in Three and a Half Distinct Parts. All right. All right. That's how I'd like to think of it, because as I was reading his story, his, his magnificent story, I thought, oh, there, there are three and a half distinct parts here. So we'll go with part one. Shall we start <laughs> with part one? Because starting at part two would be confusing. Of course it would. Tell me. So Lawson was born in London in 1869. I nearly read that as 1986. 1869. Uh, but three weeks later, his family emigrated to Ontario in Canada. Eh? Okay, baby, didn't so even know. He didn't even notice. He was on a ship. He didn't even know. He didn't know he was a Londoner. Okay, 
He didn't pick up any Cockney, apparently, at all. He, um, his father, Robert Henry Lawson, spent decades trying to perfect uh, and patent a perpetual motion machine. I've heard yep. things that don't don't end up well for people on perpetual motion machines. Oh, it worked fine. He, he's, he was a billionaire and he's still alive. Okay. Um, it, is, it has been claimed that perhaps um, his obsession with this helped form young Alfred's later appreciation and interpretation of the laws of physics. Okay. All right. Uh, in did, did his dad have a real job as well? Because... Um, I don't know. That that's where my knowledge of him disappears. I saw perpetual motion. I thought I don't need to read any more about this guy. Like unless you've actually a discovered a perpetual motion machine, I don't know if that should be your obituary. Like, it seems like he probably would have done something as well. But don't, isn't it, isn't the theory that if you do, like they will get you? Oh, I don't know. Of course they will. The big, masons. Big, yeah, big non-perpetual will get you. Like there was that story around in the I think it was the seventies about friction. this orbital big, engine. Big friction will get you. Like the, like friction. It, friction friction. There's a lot of money in friction. And if you invent yeah, a way is. to get rid of friction, yeah, no doubt. Look at you. <laughs> but uh, uh, where are we? So in 1872, he, they all moved to Detroit in Michigan and became Americans. So London, no good. Canada, no good. Michigan was the go. All right. He's a Michigan. Of course, Lawson, Lawson ran away from home and um, started hopping freight trains around the state. So he's just cruising around. So that's out. cool. What, what age is he here? Younger than 19. Uh, right. Cool. That much I can guarantee. Uh, I, I don't need precision. I just need to know roughly here. If he, if he ran away from home at 35 is a different thing <laughs> from running away from home out. at five. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's so. It's called kicked out or both my parents died. But I don't think that's it's not the same thing. <laughs> oh, I'm running away. <laughs> no, you're not. Fuck off. We're going to die rather than live with you, son. Uh, at 19, so in 1888, when he was 19, he started a baseball career. Oh, great. Yeah. And he um he made one start for the Boston Bean Eaters. That's not a great real team. name. That's that's really not a great name for a sports team. I know I know there's worse. Yeah. I know all of the racist names. Not great. And I, I'll bet there's probably some Boston? sexist names and things as well. Um, yeah, yeah, the Pittsburgh Beavers. Or <laughs> Jesus. Or or there might be some um some anti-religious ones or something like that. The yeah, yeah, some yeah, Islamophobic yeah. names. But but I think. I think that the Bean Eaters is really lame. There are Islamophobic I'm sure. Names. I'm sure there might have been. I don't know. They, they managed to get racism in there. Why didn't they get other forms of bigotry in there as well? I agree. Equal time. Equal time. Um, he also played a couple of games for the Pittsburgh Alleghenies. I don't know how you pronounce this. Alleghenies. A-double-L-E-G-H-E-N-Y-S. Alleghenies. Yeah, the Alleghenies. What don't the you, fuck does that mean? Don't you like, know what an I'm not going to tell you if you don't know. Tell me. No, 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 no. This is, look, it'd be embarrassing to tell you. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm usually embarrassed. <laughs> he, he, so he had one crack, he had two cracks with them. Then his minor league career lasted to 19, uh, 1895. So he got a good seven years in. Okay, that's a, that's a decent dude. career. That's a decent yeah, career. Okay. Was he just playing for the Eleganes and the Bean Eaters? We, and the we, Beavers. We're not going to hear some other terrible baseball names of the 19th century? Oh, God, I wish, I, I almost went down that rabbit hole, but it's not really, you know, not really grist for this mill. Um, and then apparently from uh, 1905, he became a, a manager in the minor leagues okay. to 1907. So he ended up, you know, pretty decent sort of 20 odd years of, in baseball. In 1908, he started the Union Professional League um, and it took the field in April of that year, 1908, but it folded a month later because it didn't have any cash. Not a good league. So part one gone. Bye-bye, baseball. Okay, that's, baseball. That's baseball. Part one. He was a major in the minors. He was. He was fucking huge in the tinies. Yeah, I kind of. Is that weird though? Like, like is that the the people that stay in B grade swimming or something like that because they can get all the awesome ribbons? But if they go and play A grade, they're like, no, <laughs> I got true. last. I come last. But I'm only in it for the fake trophies that anyone can buy. <laughs> Look, I don't know. I mean, I've never played minor minor league or major league baseball. But uh, if you're really big in in minor, surely the point is to go on to the majors. I would have thought, but I think it's not uncommon. I really don't know baseball. I mean, I know what it is, but I'm. I got the impression the minor leagues you can make a subsistence living. Okay, fair enough. Hitting a ball with a stick, I mean, could be worse. I think he was a pitcher, though. He was a chucker, not a slapper. I, I don't think they're the terms. I don't know a lot about baseball. I don't know a lot about baseball. But, but you know enough to know that's horseshit? Chuckers? Probably not chuckers. Chuckers and a slapper? <laughs> we, we, could re, we could redo this. So, part two. I know, it's, we're getting through this quickly already. Is it going to be Australi two. Australians explain baseball? Because I, I feel like America needs Australians to explain baseball to them. They, I think they, you might be right. Stay finally, tuned for our spin-off potty. Finally, there's the niche. I'll do it. You make the time in your diary, I'm there for it. I'll watch the baseball with you. Listen, and tell listener, if you, need, if you need a, 
uh, Australian uh, academics explain baseball, then um, have we maybe got the podcast for you? Just let us know. Dial us up. Oh, we definitely have it. This five episodes are going to be recorded by tomorrow morning. So in 1907, he um, apparently Lawson saw a dirigible flying by. Oh, my favourite word in the English language. It's uh, pretty good. Uh, I like bathyscaph too, though. Yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. But dirigible, I, I feel like it's got to be, if I ever make a pub, and I never want to make a pub, but pubs are kind of cool, dirigible's yeah. in the in the name there somewhere. I don't know how to get it. The pencil and dirigible. The pencil and dirigible? No, 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 no it's not a pencil. But, but Okay, tell me more about his dirigible, because I love dirigibles. Well, he saw it, and he was he was apparently captivated. He saw this thing, and he's like, yeah. Uh, have, 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 have we explained what a dirigible is to the listeners? Hot air balloon, but with a structure. Fancy hot air balloon, awesome, yeah. full of moustaches and stuff like that. Chock full of moustaches and probably made out of, in the early days, um, lamb intestines or something of equally course. sensitive. No, no, literally. Apparently early, um, early like Hindenburg type zeppelins and things were made out of animal guts. Imagine what that smelled like when they burned. <laughs> <laughs> Barbecue. Um, so later on he said, uh, this is quoting Lawson, that was the spark that set me afire. And forever afterward, I was unable to extinguish the aeronautical blaze that burned within me. I have got an aeronautical blaze in within me right now. I want to hear more about these dirigibles. No, no, you can get an ointment for that. You're going to be fine. He, uh, so aviation became his thing. He, he really got down and dirty. And remember, we're in like what? 1908 here. Okay, cool. So the Wright brothers are roughly the same sort of time. Um, there, would have, there would have been hot air balloons before, but dirigibles are sort of happening in this sort of era as well. I think it's probably advertising something. It, it, it wasn't clear, but he obviously saw it and just went, what? And mind, planes well and truly existed. He used the mind blown emoji. Not he did, he did. He hot, used hot the, air balloons the, um, did. Yeah, he used the, uh, the, the wireless version, the telegraph yeah. version. Yeah. So in 1908, he went to Philadelphia and he, he launched a popular aviation magazine called Fly. Oh, so cool. Straight into it. Oh, it's pretty impressive. Well, okay, no, but he did the safe version. I thought you were going to say uh, he went to Philadelphia and he started flying dirigibles on his own without any training or anything, which is cool. That'd be nice. Uh, but launching a magazine is not a high-risk manoeuvre. <laughs> Where would you get dirigible training? 1980, uh, 1997, like, I, I want to learn how to fly a balloon. It's like, all right, we'll strap you to this. Look, you're flying. Up you Congratulations. <laughs> Here's your certificate. It's, well it's, done, champ. It's the not dying that, that I want to know. Yeah, that's not guaranteed. That's, that's post-grad. <laughs> So according to him, he, he started this magazine to stimulate public interest and educate readers in the fundamentals of the new science of aviation. God, they're high and mighty back in those days. They're fucking lofty. Why, why couldn't they, they just say, I want cool stories about dirigibles and yeah. I freaking want to get photographed with one, even maybe in one and maybe up in the air. That's what yeah. I want. Yeah. I'm basically, I'm doing this journalism so I get to go up in the air. because. Yeah, yeah, I want to fly. Look, here's a plane. You ever heard of a plane? That's a thing that flies without hot air. They didn't exist no, yet. Not good enough. They didn't exist yet didn't exist yet yeah they did they did they existed what year are we talking i don't know 1908 yeah they, no no right brothers so well I mean, we're pretty close um the magazine cost 10 cents sold around the country so you know it got out there cool yeah good for him 1910 he moved to new york and he renamed the magazine aircraft fly was catchy yeah. fly was yeah and fly that's why it became you know a, a way to describe someone who was cool in the late 90s just fly because of that magazine. All right. All right. So he renamed it aircraft and he kept publishing until 1914. And it chronicled the technical developments of early aviation pioneers. So it was already, it was starting to talk about actual fly machines and stuff, which is kind of cool. I know it's a lot cool. He's, he's no. look, he's a, he's a tech journalist. He's a tech blogger. Um, back when the aircraft <laughs> industry was very new. So good on him. Yeah. Hey, look, there's a lot of people that have fun careers doing that. They're not the makers, but they're good friends with the makers. And yeah. uh, history doesn't... Always listen. looking for content, and those guys are always looking for a way to put themselves out there. We know this. And you obviously get to go second in the dirigible after after the inventor, maybe. Yeah, after the first guy lives, or the first person who lives, then you die. Um, so he was the first to advocate for commercial air travel, apparently. And it is claimed by some, but not all sources agree, that he coined the term airline. Really? But hang on, yeah. uh, commercial airlines needed... An, I, I get that there was a period when there weren't commercial airlines, yeah, for but, most of human history, I think. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. And and the first people doing it were totally just let's let's see if this shit will get up in the air. Cool. And you're not making a buck just yet. But I would have thought straight away that commercial, it's pretty obvious. Like well, like you you kind of brought this up. You, you've seen those early planes, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, know, I, I would, you know, you've seen them, right? Yeah. They barely get one person in them. 
I know, I know. And even that is contestable. Should you? But but it's been well proven before that time that people paid money to get themselves to travel themselves and and letters and goods and other shit around the place. And yeah. so so they they've yeah. seen boats and they go, okay, boats way advanced technology compared to planes right now. But maybe within a year or two, people might put a letter in this, and you can yeah. get your letter a little bit further, and maybe even a package, or maybe even a person. So, and, and look, boats have always been described as floating dirigibles anyway. So you can imagine people would have made that connection quite quickly. I think it would have been a brave person, is all I'm saying. It would have been a brave person to see the Wright brothers, Wright brothers, flying there a couple of hundred meters and saying, "Yep, I see no money in this ever." <laughs> yeah, well, this is shit. I thought that about the internet. Look how good I was. Uh, perfect. <laughs> um, but also someone had to be first to kind of go, you know what? Okay. Let's make some bucks. Um, he also apparently advocated really strongly for an American flying force and he lobbied Congress in 1913. Wow. So he was, and they want, he wanted them to expand and appropriate army aircraft. Wow. And if, if, I know. Yeah. Okay. Early, early before yeah, World War yeah, One. He was early, early guy. Um, in his issue of air, uh, aircraft in 1916, in an issue, he started making predictions about the future of aviation. Uh, there was a few, I'll only, I'll only read you one. So one of these was um, prior to the year 1970, air traffic will be practiced to such an extent, 60 years traffic in the future. rules of the air. Yeah. Huh? So he's talking 50, 60 years in the future. Yeah. He's talking yeah. 60 years in the future saying, so before 1970, um, there'll be such aircraft traffic that the rules of the air will have to be enforced. Certain routes will be charted altitudinally altitudinally you can go high you height, can go low yeah height, yep. and the large long distance ships being given the right of way at the higher altitude so that was one of his predictions i am sad he was, I'm, he was right he was it right he was right effect. except for the fact that we we don't call them airships which mm -mm. um is sadly disappointing i, I wish i wish maybe if one one airline went out on on its own and said yeah. you know we don't have planes we have airships uh you know Qantas, famous oh, for maybe. its airships the A380 Except airship. that does mean, that means like a, a, a Zeppelin, right? I don't know. Well, look, uh, in loving a the word dirigible, I love the concept of dirigibles, and I'd be very happy to take, um, if it took a week to get to the other side of the world, but you're in a dirigible and you get to have a moustache and a snifter oh. of brandy all the time. Oh, uh, oh see? you're killing see? me. See? A feather bed in your stateroom. Oh, it'd be fucking fabulous. You imagine you're sitting up there, you've got internet connection, you're reading your book, you're smoking your cigars, oh. you're wearing your spats and your moustache and you're just watching the world trundle by. I reckon that'd be wonderful. Yeah, believe me, I am so disappointed that the that is not our world. It was our idea first. Anyone nicks this and we want 43% of <laughs> well, the Well, I think interest. it's this Lawson guy's idea first, but we're third. So back just before all this stuff in 1913, before he started yelling at the government to, you know, make um, more army planes, make he learned how to fly two kinds of craft. The Sloan Depedusen, you uh, know the one, you know the one. <laughs> the Depedusen? That's yeah. the name of something? Sloan hyphen Depedusen. Well, I'm guessing, oh, okay, so so that's hyphen. I thought Sloan was like the manufacturer, so I, I would take No, that no, no, it was like the Sloan Depedusen airplane. Uh, uh, and also the... Moisson de Blériot monoplane. <laughs> and apparently he became quite an accomplished pilot. So that's pretty impressive. So I'm just pouring myself a delicious oatmeal stout. Well, stop it. I wish you had one of those, Will. I would fax it to you, but stop you, you it. can't. Stop it. Your planning's not your strong suit, obviously. Um, okay, so later that year of 1913, he bought a Thomas flying boat. Yes, yes. Those are cool too. Look, there, I, I, I did confess to a love of the word dirigible, but, but seaplanes, like... Seaplane, a no, flying boat. This is a flying boat. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, fair. So enough. it's a boat that flies, not a plane that sees. <laughs> you got to get the order right. Is there a big difference? Are you can tell me a big difference between those two categories. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. phonetics. Right. Flying boat. Give me more flying boat action. And apparently, he became the first air commuter. He would regularly fly from his house, his house in New Jersey, to the foot of the seventy fifth street, uh, foot of seventy fifth street, oh, New York City. Oh yeah. So 35 miles a day, he'd kind of commute and back again. <laughs> There's that guy. Oh, look. Freaking fabulous. He'd be pretty famous. And like, that, that's cool. That's so cool. Especially with the moustache flowing out the windows, flapping behind him because <laughs> he's got to leave the windows open. Um, so he um, he decided he started hunting funding to start an aircraft factory. Now, I just want to stop you for a second here. You said that there's, there's three and a half parts to this guy. 
Yeah. Um, please tell me that he can't turn out to be rotten or evil because I'm loving him so much right now. He's living he's living the dirigible life, the, the sea boat life. He's, Why would he be evil? I, I, I just want to feel like maybe if I get a time machine that I am yeah. actually him, that I've gone back to New York in 1911 oh, and, and I'm flying sea boat. Just, just allow me that fantasy. Please the don't tell I'm me. The reason I'm telling you about t- this he, is because... Uh, you, you. You're gonna t- you're gonna tell me that he's like some genocide guy, um, and he does it by a plane or something like that. Yes, he kills people with planes, and he was an early adopter. <laughs> Not bombs, actually, the planes themselves. He could pick them up and swing them around, and he would scythe children down in playgrounds. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be true. What a terrible human! No, look, I, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna throw you one small bone. He's not a murderer, nor was he ever. Thank you. All right, I can empathise with him now properly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Then maybe. I don't know. We're only at part two. We haven't gotten to part three or three and a half. So he started hunting for money. He wanted to uh, start an aircraft factory. Yep. So in early 1917, he was on the sniff. And some business chaps in Wisconsin thought this sounds pretty good. So he started the Lawson Aircraft Corporation. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to build training planes for the Army. Um, full disclosure, some people called it the Lawson Aircraft Company. So, I mean, whew, sources, eh? Anyway, Lawson Aircraft Corporation Company. Uh, I know it's important. Uh, Inc. 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 Yeah. Incorporated. PTL, Ltd. Proprietary Limited Company Incorporated Limited Corporation. OBE AOCPM LMFAO. In, indeed, indeed, with yeah. an ABN. Yes, definitely with an ABN or the American equivalent. So their first prototype was the Lawson Military Trainer One. Of course. Uh, Catchly known as the no, MT1. No, 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 no. See, that's that's a rookie error. What you have to do is you name it like uh, the Lawson Trainer 1001, and then people see, they people yeah. and, and they say, oh, okay, they've done like a thousand prototypes before. We just happen to find. be up at a thousand and one. Yeah. yeah. I saw, I we saw call it the Dragon Death Monster Training Plane, and you're like, fuck you, I don't care what it does. It sounds awesome, and it would kill people. <laughs> well, there's that. There's that. I got, I got an invoice from something the other day. I don't know what it was. It was like a, a bakery. I ordered something online, and and the, uh-huh. it said uh, goods order number, uh, like, one trillion um, and <laughs> seventy five. <laughs> I'm like, that's ambitious. Like you, you've you done, back. <laughs> you've done. Okay, one I'm not mad. Orders. It took you two weeks. Now you had a lot to get through. <laughs> I just love one zero 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 seventy five. It's like cool. I, I I can see how your system works. Trillion. I love a trillion. Uh, where were we? So the MT one, the yeah, uh, MT one, sparklingly labeled. It first flew late um, late 1917. And Lawson was the guy. At That's the quite controls. slow. That's quite. I mean, just I mean, not to critique his entrepreneurial speed. No, here. it's fast. Started in March 1917. By September, he was flying. Okay, that's fine. That that's good. But all I'm saying is is that World War One is happening pretty quickly here, and the world yeah. is is embracing. Yeah. Like the Red Baron, um, like he's yes. dropping his little bomblets um, out the window. Bomblets. Yeah, Monsieur bit, von Richthofen. Yeah, you know, he's picking them up from his feet, like they're little packages, like like. Oh, that's true. And you nefariously leave every game <laughs> as you drop them indeed, on the passersby. So yeah. I'm, I'm just saying the world has embraced aviation here. Um, also, actually, I'm going to take back my defense of him because really they're made out of basically what bits of plywood and, and, and canvas. So how long could that take? Staple gun, a bit of balsa wood, a small engine, boom. All right. Uh, listener, um, if you happen to be versed in engineering in some sort of way, I think it would be fun if you and Rod and I made an old school plane and then yes. someone, someone else can go up in it and we can film that yes. of, of how terrible Rod and I would be at making an old school plane. I'm in, um, I'm in, I'm in, I'm done. I don't, I don't, I don't even need any more details. <laughs> Name a date, a place and a time. Boom. There. I'll be wearing my hat and my tool belt. Um, so anyway, so Lawson flew the first flight and it lasted about 15 minutes. And after he'd finished, uh, Lawson quote, boys, any old woman that don't drink, smoke or chew tobacco ought to be able to fly the MT-1. That's how safe we have made her. Okay. Uh, so threw in a bit of sexism there, but... Um, but no, 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 equality, because he said boys and then he mentioned women. Uh, indeed. So indeed, it's balanced. Indeed. But, he, yeah, but, but also, why are they not allowed to drink or smoke? Like... I don't know. And they have to be old too. Okay. It's old women. Okay. But he's he's claiming, I'm just being generous to him for a moment yes. here. He's claiming he made a, a, a cool plan that's really easy to fly. Yeah. Even even a sober old woman who doesn't smoke could fly it. And we all know that's the yardstick. Would she be better if she was smoking? Probably, like I'm thinking if he said, listen, even a pissed old fart who had cigarettes hanging out of every orifice could fly it. 
that would be more of an endorsement. Indeed. Male or female. <laughs> Look, no doubt, no doubt. And maybe that's the that's the hidden centerfold of aircraft where they've got the, the illicit images of people. That is hot. Yeah, indeed. The hidden centerfold. Fly, Has anyone revealed flying it? Flying in the not, nude. Not. Oh, God. The, oh, I'm getting an image. I'll just have to pause. <sighs> So in January 1918, so we're a couple months later, he goes to the military and says, I want to sell you this. And they said, no, we want a better one. Well, of course. I, um, I don't so, know what's the problem with it, but anyway. No, they want a better. You know, you know what you've done? Oh, we want that plus. Mm. That plus. Give us a plus. So he went back and they enhanced the MT1 and they created, are you ready? MT2. Fuck yeah. You, you know this story? I, I, look, I looked ahead. I, saw I knew you knew it. I saw your notes. <laughs> you or did they finally embrace the one trillion and two? No? They should have, shouldn't they? Like if, if it was the 1,000 one, they can make it 2017. Make it more convincing. Um, so it flew for the first time in May of 1918. So I, was, I was right. It was the MT2. It was the MT2, okay, yeah, right. yeah. 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 Um, it reached a top airspeed of 90 miles per hour, which is about 4,000 kilometers. It's really not. It's 150 Ks. Give or take. It's 150 um, Which was 12, uh, 12 miles per hour faster than the MT1. So you got... That's cool. A set sort of a twenty percent, technically better, percent, eleven percent increase. Um, he also made other enhancements that were made to meet the military requirements. More boot room, uh, glove box. Uh, yep, yep. Somewhere for your spit and polish. Somewhere to keep your cigars or yep. your or your cigarettes for smoking while while driving. We have to smoke. This the only way you can relax in the military is to Snifter have a cigarette. Snifter of brandy. Yep, that's for officers only. I suppose you had to be an officer to fly, didn't you? Um, and so he had a purchase agreement signed for the MT two by the army. So it's cool. We signed off. Boom, boom, boom. Then the armistice happened and everything got canned. Oh. Fucking peace. Oh. Peace broke out and oh. killed everything. Yeah, I'm so sad. I am too. The armistice also killed. He was he was designing. He'd started designing the Lawson Armored Battler, really? which had a metal fuselage or would have. Uh, and- <laughs> but I know metal, metal in a plane. I mean, what will I think of next? But that got killed. It only got to the design phase um, because of the armistice again. So fucking peace ruined everything as usual. Ah, um, don't sympathise the company with the shut down. Okay, sorry. Don't sympathise with the profiteers. I, I don't. I, I, mean, I sympathise with. Here. They're helping here. I get it. I like the technology though. But the aircraft company shut down in 1919. So that's a bit sad. Uh, but he, but he, he was not perturbed. He wanted to create a large transport aircraft. Is this where dirigibles are coming back? Is is they never come back? Oh, are you serious? Did, uh, this Do you is, want to pause and have a little cry? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go and write a different episode right now. It's gonna be <laughs> properly about dirigibles. Jesus, I can wait. You can do a spin off. That's okay. Wholesome too. The spin off. Nothing but air balloons. Um. So he was really excited about getting a large transport aircraft. So he needed to get more money. He finally found finance towards the end of 1919, and he started a project to build America's first airline. There you go. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was the Lawson Transportation Company. Transportation, as opposed to whatever the other bugger was called, I already forgot. Aircraft Corporation, now we're talking the transportation yeah, company. Yeah, one's, one's making, one's, one's using them. Yeah, kind of a bit of both. So uh, he found the money, he started the company to build the planes. It was about building the planes to begin with. Is he still blogging yeah. at this time? Yes, he's blogging furiously. Now the magazine shut down in about 1914, okay. 15. Yep. No more fly, bro. If you, can get a, if you can get an issue of that, you basically paid your mortgage. Are you serious? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Hundred yeah. percent. No, take was, that to the bank. Here's me thinking, oh, I could go hunt for a, an episode. I know awesome. how to do this. Um, in less than a year, they built and demonstrated a biplane, and he coined the term airliner to describe it. It was Excellent. an airliner. No one disputes that he coined the term airliner. Cool. I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's a claim to fame. It's not sure. um, curing cancer, um, but inventing the term airliner. That's that's very good. It's pretty cool. Um, and it could take eighteen passengers. Hey, that's heaps. Yeah, given the closest competition was in Europe and they could carry four. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, so big difference. Um, and he, he, he Was this by squeezing wild. them all in? Like yes, they, they, lying they, them on top of each other, like piling them up. <laughs> Hold your breath. We'll tell you when to breathe out. And they all, they, they've they all got to smoke their cigars out the end. And yeah, carry yeah, yeah. Them brandy. And, and you tie them together with their moustaches. They still get brandy that, and cigars, yeah. Of course, they're not animals. They might be packed in like sardines, but they're not animals. Um, he demonstrated how effective it was. He had a 2,000 mile multi city tour. So from Milwaukee to Chicago, Toledo, Cleveland, Buffalo, Syracuse, New York City, Washington, D.C., 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, back to Milwaukee. Yeah, that's cool. And, and so the press was pretty positive. Everyone was quite excited. Did he take 18 people with him each time? And That I don't know. And just sort of leave them there and they find your own way home. But let's have another 18. We can go to New York now. You right. stack them in because once they've been in the air for a while, they start to dehydrate and pack down. You can put some more people on top of them. That would be my guess. Just, I'm no uh, biology expert. Not a good guess. But people were blown away. So he basically developed an airline system that could get you, you could fly from New York to San Fran in 36 hours, which is faster than walking. Oh, and, and wild for the time. It must have been, I mean, what, mm. would be, what would be the comparable trains in those days? I don't know. It must have been a week or something like that. Or I'm We're guessing. Talking what? Uh, like a coal burning blah, blah, blah train. Yeah, a steam train. Seven months. <laughs> no, less than seven months. Less than seven Don't months. Don't you know your transport history? You should, yes. You should have a good feel for, you know, distance and time over in the fourth dimension here. You know how you can't tell head size? I can't tell distance. Oh, I could tell head size. I saw a photo the other day of Kerry Packer. Listen, sorry for the digression here. A photo of <laughs> Kerry, Kerry Packer and uh, Malcolm Turnbull, like back in the in the 80s or something. And finally, I could see Kerry Packer, tiny head, Malcolm Turnbull, huge head. I, I never Packer thought had a that tiny before. head. Yeah, it's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. If you're looks, one of our millions of overseas listeners, look up Kerry Packer and you'll be as surprised as me because his head looked like you could hit it with a very big frying pan I know, and it wouldn't make a dent. That is the weird thing to me. That is like maybe there was some sort of distortion field around it, but suddenly he had a tiny head. He looked. Like, did you ever see that terrible Super Mario Brothers movie in the in the 1990s? He looked like as opposed boom. to the good one. <laughs> did that star Bob Hoskins? It did indeed. Yeah. Okay, I've seen the ads. <laughs> It's stuck in my head. I might yeah. watch that tonight, actually. I'll have a hamburger and watch a little Super Mario's. Um, so anyway, people were blown away. They thought it was fantastic. Crowds would gather. They all just went, wow, aviation, it's wild. Um, in late 1920, he got government contracts for airmail routes and to deliver 10 warplanes. So things are, you know, kicking off. But then in 1920, the recession hit. So, you know circumstances conspired yeah. he couldn't raise he needed a hundred thousand bucks in cash reserves to sort of underwrite the contracts but he couldn't raise it because the recession mm. so he had to decline all those contracts he had oh. to decline the air routes had to decline the warplanes it's hard work making an airline i know mm. like what's his name richard branson made it look so easy well, call it virgin boom yeah i don't know it's been bailed out a fair bit so anyway. yeah that's because of now uh in 1920 though he also um because of the success of his first airliner he somehow, I don't know how, I, I had a rummage but couldn't find it. He somehow got a million bucks what? to build 26 passenger midnight liner. That so sounds cool. From 18 to 26 passengers and he called it the midnight liner. He started to do some marketing. As opposed to the anyway. flying to different cities, which was great marketing before. But anyway, that's awesome. So but, he, but you need a name. So you need a sexy name. Like you can fly from here to here in 36 hours, but what's the aircraft called? That's yeah, but, obviously your first question. Yeah, but, but midnight, you know, that says to me, you're, you're up late at night. Uh, that's not great, you know. Um, no, no, it's mysterious. It's dark. I'm on no, the midnight. No, no, liner. look, okay. It, Chicks love bad boys, dude. It sounds to me like you're taking the crappy flight. I'd like I'd like to the get there. Oh, the red eye, but no one knew about that yet. Yeah, there you go. The get, the get there early. They weren't as jaders as we. Um, so its maiden flight was May 8th, 1921. It crashed on takeoff and that was the end of the company. Cool, as it would be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, watch this, watch this, Whoosh, gone. Okay, fuck you, company, gone. I, I just, the the bravery, not only, I, I accept the, the bravery of the early pilots um, and the early, yes. early engineers. They're putting, they're putting their life on the line to test these things. I, I think that uh, something should be said for the bravery of the early passengers to go, yeah, I'll, I'll, not, I'll pay for that and, oh. and what odds oh. of death there are. Look, I, I, it didn't say, I couldn't find anything that said, but my guess is possibly the maiden flight didn't have passengers. Oh, it's not really a maiden flight then. Well, it's a flight and it's the first time. <laughs> no, but that's like a test flight. You know, you... Um, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. I'm just thinking like, like losing, no, I'm, that could get into virginity and whether it should be a gangbang. I'm not going to go there. Whoa. I just, that wouldn't be right of me. Why did you, what is wrong with you, man? I don't know. It's not been diagnosed. <laughs> so in 1926, he had a crack at uh, another airliner, 56-seater, two-tiered Lawson super airliner. So... Two levels of passengers? Yeah. That's so cool. Like a jump. Fuck yeah. It's no, what is it, Spruce Goose from that mad old, was it Howard Hughes? But yeah. it's, you know, it's pretty impressive. Um, how, and how, how many was it again? 56 seats. That's cool. He started. Started, I think, is the operative word. Um, and at this point in history, he was considered one of the leading thinkers in the budding aviation industry in America, probably therefore globally. He received 
the coveted Winged America Award. I know. I've always wanted one. What, Don't know what, about you. Is this just is this like a presidential medal of freedom, but for aeronautical people? But for flapping your arms. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And the Scientific Age magazine in 20, 1927 called him the world's leading passenger airplane builder, which is great, but there's probably only three other people. But, you know, good for him. He was that person. He was one of them. Yeah, I've never um, been in the top yeah. three of, of uh, passenger airline builders, so good on him. I don't think I've been in the top three of anything. I'm sorry. Guy's name Rod? Okay. I don't know. Top three uh, science communication related podcast broadcast out of Canberra, though. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Top four. Boom. Top four, maybe. Top four. At least top four. Occasionally top three. Uh, in 1928, he wanted to, he had one more crack. He wanted to get into the airline industry with a hundred passenger design, but that never happened. Um, he had a crack. He designed it, but he didn't finish and it certainly didn't get off the air. So he, he's, he's been hailed as, you know, a standout contributor to the early days of the aviation industry. But because he usually had so much trouble getting money, to, especially towards these later times, um, he kind of lost a little interest and his thoughts began to turn to economics, philosophy, and much, much more. And this brings us to part three. Oh, is this where he's the murderer? I said he never murdered anyone and that's true. <laughs> All right. Part three, the obvious next step. So in part three, he began to pronounce and propound on pretty much everything. Mm. So he was he was a prolific uh, writer of stuff. Again, he's a blogger. I told you he's he's just he's absolutely just continued. This guy had his quill and parchment in his back pocket all the time. Sorry, in his breeches all, all right. the time. What did he write? So apparently, even during his aviation days, he wrote things like a novel. He wrote a novel called Born Again, cool. which started to talk about the development of a philosophy, which it seems merged into the thing we're about to get into. All right. You seem worried. Of course I'm worried because you, you're not – look, I never try to make you happy. Uh, so <laughs> so I, I, I'm not expecting – Finally, you admit it. I'm not expecting you to try and make me happy. <laughs> no, I'm going to make you very happy. <laughs> Eventually, I'm going to get to the point where I, I – uh, people listening, I texted Will at one point and said, I just saw a headline that made me laugh out loud for two minutes. I must do this story now. So your challenge is to guess. Which is the when headline? that comes in. Uh, okay, all right, fair enough. Or at least what the substance of the headline was. I don't think you'll find it hard. Uh, okay, so he often wrote about himself and often in the third person. Sign of awesomeness. It, isn't it though? Yeah. Um, he had a pseudonym, which was Cy Q Faunts. Cy, C-Y, Q, full stop, Faunts. So he's Elon Musk's and Grimes' other child. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and I think Psyche also Fawns. It's it's a nineteen fifties like comic book <laughs> supervillain name. You know, Psy Q Fawns. I'm not IQ. I'm Psy Q because technology. Uh, so I think he was ahead of the game. Actually, I think he was. Um, this guy was ahead of his time. Um, and Lawson claimed via potentially Psy, but maybe himself. It kind of seems to blur. He claimed, "quote His mind responds to every question." And the problems that stagger the so-called wise men are as kindergarten stuff to him. Oh, of course. Of course. I'm so far beyond you. I'm answering questions that, that you haven't even thought of. So you're, you're like a child. What to is me. the I point mean, of having yeah. a conversation? Yeah. Um, he also said, uh, quote, to try to write a sketch of the life and works of Alfred W. Lawson in a few pages is like trying to restrict space itself. It cannot be done. <laughs> <laughs> too big for so, you. I am too big for you. I'm too awesome. You can't even yeah, do any of it. Not, not I. He. This does, is third person now. He's does, he's writing about this man, Alfred W. Lawson. Does he does he give examples? Does at any point does do, intrinsically apparent? Yeah. Okay. All right. I am the the awesomest. All right. He in fact uh, at one point referred to his own birth as uh, quote the most momentous occurrence since the birth of mankind. Did he take something? No, maybe did, he should have. Did something happen to him in a in a because he seemed normal when he was like baseball guy and airplane guy and magazine yeah. airplane guy. It seems to be a fairly strong pivot here. There's a strong pivot, and look, to be fair, the the, the airline industry can you know it's claimed a lot of scalps. He was okay, maybe maybe the, when he was the first airplane commuter, um, maybe he suddenly thought this is it. I I have touched God because yeah. this is what God wants us to do is yeah. air, airplane commute. So yes. therefore, you know, I have seen through the veil of, of consciousness. I have touched What man can life. fly at his own whim? To work. Exactly. To work. Or just to go and have no, 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 to a work, show. To work. To work. I mean, God, to work. God still wants you to go to work, but flying to work, that is the amazing thing. Funny would be like you fly into New York, you have a few beers and, you know, watch a band and then get back in your plane. No, no, I'll, I'll take you back to NJ. That'd be awesome. 
I wonder if anyone does that. Well, there's no air cops to test if you're drunk. There still aren't, are there? I'm sure there are. Uh, in, in, in airport, um, that's a very different world. I, I, no, airports, but I'm talking you know, like your own private helicopter. You reckon there's dudes who pull you over in a drone and go blow in this bag? Of course not. Of course not. Like if you're flying around, a fl- if you're flying around like the back of Western Australia, like the Royal Flying Doctor Surgeon, you can be as drunk as you want. So you're saying doctors are drunk? I mean, I mean not legally. I'm just saying that you could, you could probably get away with it. I've never heard of anyone arrested for it. Can't be illegal. Oh. So he, yes, he referred to himself and his own birth as yeah, most momentous occurrence since the birth of mankind. And the seeds of this life-spanning philosophy had been planted now mm-hmm. from the novel, from these utterances, and it would go on to be known as Lawsonomy. <laughs> it sounds like something you do to yourself, though. It's true, like self lawsoning yeah, Indeed, indeed. I mean, just I know. Leave me alone. I'm just, I'm just lawsoning. That's not his fault because that's his last name. And if you're going to name a philosophy after yourself, then you just go last name ism or onomy or something like that. But uh, yours could be called granting. Granting. No, that's that's good. that's already taken. Like that word is already taken. Yeah, but so is lawsonomy. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that in normal conversation, Gran- I'd be broke. Grantian. So Grantian. I'll go with Grantian. Yes. Grantian. Yeah, it's like Gramscian. Like I'll be, I'll, I'll be I know, like, I like that. Because <laughs> I'm already Lambertian. You know, that's been quoted all over the place. Of course, I know, no doubt. I mean, the time of my birth, it was written. Um, so he used to speak about patriotism, diet, freedom of expression, spiritual worship, economics, the organization of society, etc. Again, again, it's these people in the early 20th century and their love of both diet and, uh, and weird, yeah. weird political philosophy. And you know, I love a diet guy. Oh, I, I'm, I'm I, I, I know that. I know that. I'm a big fan. Um, so he had, he apparently at, at his peak, he had a whole bunch of followers and they were uh, described as being very well disciplined. They had a kind of military sort of hierarchy and wore uniforms. Mm. Um, there was a law sonomy newspaper called the Benefactor. Mm. In the 1930s, it claimed to have a circulation of more than 6 million. Wow. Really? And in 1930s America, there are only 7 million people. So we, that's quite a bit. I mean, uh, sure, we print 6 million copies. Doesn't mean people read it, but still, that's enormous. It's not the Australian. They, they're not lying. They yeah. wouldn't lie. <laughs> so do we have oh, a... sorry. For have international a, listeners, the Australian is a newspaper run by um, Murdoch. No, do, we, do we have a, a feel for the tenets of Lawsonomy? Oh, we're going to get to that. All right, good. Not the social ones, man. I don't upset you. Um, he, he wrote a book called The Short Speeches as Spoken by Alfred Lawson. Yeah. Mystical. No one knows what's in it. He could have just, he could have edited the title a little bit. Short speeches. Yeah, exactly. Or just the speeches. Like, don't, don't, don't downplay Speech. them. Speech. Speech. There you go. Alfred Lawson. Yeah, fine. Um, hey. And apparently it had photos and stories and speeches that he made to crowds in international amphitheaters. So one in Chicago, the International Amphitheater in Chicago in 1935, apparently was very full, overflowing, in fact. Um, Milwaukee Auditorium in 1937, thousands of people apparently turned up. Pretty, pretty interesting. So he's, he had a following. People were listening to him and reading his books or at least buying them or whatever. Um, he had some health practices, mm. which uh, always makes me happy. Do you, do you mean in the sense of like a doctor's practice or do you mean in the sense no. of a practice with a CE or an SE? Did he do it I don't himself? Know. I, or I, did he, I don't or, see spelling. Uh, things that he would do. Okay, right. So CSE, he used both because, you know, he's, he's, he could do whatever he wanted. Um, so like he was like many people of these early times, vegetarianism was a thing, just yep. like Hitler and, you know, Kellogg and everyone else. Um, just like Hitler. You can't casually say just like Hitler. <laughs> like there's no scenario in which you go, I mean, you, you say, oh, someone had a moustache just like Hitler. You know, it's, it's, it's dialed. Did Hitler into- not have a moustache? No, indeed he did. He did. But, was he not a vegetarian? Uh, in, indeed. But there are a lot of normal, nice people that are vegetarians. And so saying someone oh, is a vegetarian. Name just 11. Like, I want 11 no, it's, names it's, and it's I want to address It's not a fair comparison. You can't do that comparison. Unless, also, it was unless, Hitler. unless you were saying someone is a fascist that wants to genocide people just like Hitler, then fair, you can. And a vegetarian just you, like Hitler. But you can't do that. You can't do that. But I included, you know, Dr. Kellogg as well. So I balanced it out with a reasonable guy. Yeah, but still, you can't, you know, you're not allowed to do that. It's just not how comparisons work. Okay, I, I wanted, I'd like to offer a formal apology to the estate of uh, William Lawson. He was not just like Hitler. Indeed. Well, he might turn out to be, and I don't know enough about him yet. No, no, he doesn't turn out like Hitler. Our lawyers are all now very relieved. We have a team of lawyers okay. at the Holston Show. Good. 
Um, it's also been reported that he used to like to start his day um, by dunking his head in a bucket of iced water because oh, that would great. stimulate his brain cells. Oh, look, I'm sure. I'm sure that there are people on Instagram right now uh, showing how they start the day by dunking their yeah. head in them. And I'm sure yeah. uh, it feels invigorating and and allows you to virtue signal out the wazoo. But, geez, yeah. calm down. Just like Hitler. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> I mean, sure, Hitler might have done those things. God, can you imagine the health practices Hitler would be in on if, if he was on Instagram right now? He'd be all over the weird stuff. Oh, that's almost worth it, but <laughs> we can't bring him back. So, you know, that's um, what you, that, if yeah. you have a time machine, you don't go back and kill baby Hitler. You bring Hitler to now yes. and, and see what weird stuff he has to do. Yes. Um, he, he basically claimed through a bunch of things that he'd found the secret of living to 200. Did he make it? Spoiler alert, no. No. Well, he, actually, no, he... What was it? 1887? So he wouldn't even be there yet. So, Well, now we're in the 1920s and 30s, to be yeah, fair. Um, no, when he was born. That, that's how you work uh, out 80, someone's age. 88 or something. Yeah, 1887 plus 200 makes 200 at 2087. So we're not there yet. So we don't know if he made it to 200. Well, we do. Well, no. We know he didn't. He might be I, I, I'm gonna. I know I've ruined the story. I might as well stop. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> Fucking death. I know, right? So economic theory. So he, he was into that. Yep. And, and quite noisily into that. So during the Great Depression, he uh, he launched the economic theory of direct credits, which basically he, he said the banks are the cause of all economic woes. They are the oppressors of both capital and of labor. Um, some people say he was inspired to do this because he you know cared about the plight of the poor. Mm. Others said it was just because he found it hard to fund his projects at times. It could be both. It could be both. I know. Why is it either or? What's wrong with these people? Um, in 1931, he wrote a book called Direct Credits for Everybody. And he organised the Direct Credit Society. It's kind of a, it's kind of a nice title. Like you, you feel like that you feel like what it's arguing for on the tin. Like that's he's got a good title yeah. there. I like that. Yeah. One. If someone said to you, "Would you like some direct credits?" You, you have to say yes. But but it also didn't say direct credits for people who are not you or direct credits for oh, everybody. Yeah. We all win. A rising tide drowns all boats. So for him, uh, you need to do away with financiers. A direct payment had to go. It was proportional to the amount of work an individual did. From the money system would be owned, controlled, and operated by the people themselves. Ah, okay. The only value money had was as a measure of value of land or products of labor. So like no stocks, things like that. No, none of this speculation, I assume. There was also no interest. So uh, money would be loaned with the government acting as a trustee and there'd be no charges. Yeah, Okay. Um, and he believed the government should replace banks as a provider of loans, etc. His rallies and lectures got thousands of people in the 30s. This is a, a big part of the reason the aforementioned uh, mm -hmm. uh, crowds went so well because he was advocating, as far as they saw, I saw free cash. Um, and this this is what really blossomed into full blown lawsonomy. This is when the, it really started to take off. So he combined religion and economics. It was based on uh, a belief in adherence that he called to. Natural laws. But uh, so actually, I mean, the religion and economics thing is not that wild. Uh, mm -mm. Historically, that's been that's been the thing that religions have actually talked about quite a lot. I mean, you look at yeah. look at some of the biggest biggest parts of early and all through mid cent, um, mid period Christianity has been that uh, rejection of interest rates. So yeah, yeah, not just rates, just interest. So interest. Uh, it's it's something that that religion in favor have. of becoming the biggest landlords on the planet. Details, well, details. Look, it's part of it, but no, but details. um, but religions have been very economically interested yes and so uh, for me the red flag is when you start making claims like these are natural laws because mm. oh. me i'm like nature huh good for you let's keep going um so the subtleties of his concepts he claimed could be understood unless you also understood physics obviously um and for him uh, economics is a side partner of physics like a couple that can't be separated uh, okay welcome to part three and a half oh, good okay here we go <laughs> Here we go. Get comfy. Maybe I should open a delicious uh, oatmeal stout. Stop it. Jesus. You wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it. How many have you got there? All of them. So, yes, we're at part three and a half. Physics and the University of Lawsonomy. Mm. I mean, it wasn't only about physics, but it certainly uh, played a strong role in the way he operated. So, in 1942, he founded the University of Lawsonomy. Although I have seen some people say 1943, so... For those of you who are waiting to say, you bastard, you got it wrong. Sticklers for history. Uh, the Lawsonian advocates now will obviously Hist be sticklers. hunting St you down. Sticklorists. Um, according to Lawson, again a quote, 99%, roughly estimated, of the human race lack imagination. 
Well, that's a little bit harsh. Isn't it? Uh, perhaps you have unwittingly spent your life as a dullard because you've, you've, uh, cause until you've learned lawsonomy, you are not educated. Mm, yeah, okay. Duh, I've always said so. I know you have. That's how I start most of my lectures <laughs> in any course. Until you have, have learned lawsonomy. Oh, I thought you were going to say until you've learned Lambert's. Or Lambert's what'd you go with? Lambertsian? Lambertsiosity. Yeah, Lambertsiosity. Yeah, until you've learned that. But okay. Hmm. So at the uni, students would learn the science of lawsonomy from teachers who are known as knowledgeians. Stop it. Fuck you don't, yeah. You don't need a new word for teachers or lecturers or professors, I guess. But, but you don't yeah, you need. you do. You don't need Wouldn't you like to be called knowledgeian Grant? I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't. I'm going to call myself Look, that unless, from now on. Unless everyone else is doing it, I'm not joining in on that one. I'm not going to no, be the I'm first changing. One. I'm changing my official email signature to knowledge and Lamberts. All right. All right. I will pay you. How much? How much? Am, I don't know. I don't know. What's, what, what, I want direct credits for this. No. Will you, do, will you change your email signature to knowledge for $10? Yeah. <laughs> Damn, you're cheap. I'll do it for one. I think it'd just be funny. All right. How long are you going to leave it in there? Two years. <laughs> Yes. My my uh, uh, yeah. signature block said the Center for Pubic Awareness of Science for five or six years before someone told me. I didn't realize. <laughs> L- literally, that that is a true story. You know, I that's thought. you're famous for your details. There you go. Fuck! I laughed when I saw that. I was like, this is gold, <laughs> and made me wonder how many other people would have seen it and not said anything. That would have been funnier. No way to know. Yep. Anyway, the school had indisputable tenants. Or tenets. I apologize. And what I really like is I can't find another source for this, but one source. This is this is the four. Education is the science of knowing truth. Mm, okay. Miseducation is the art of absorbing falsity. Yeah. Truth is that which is, not that which ain't. Cool. Okay. We're, we're getting a lot of tautologies here. Like they're circular. Falsity is that which ain't, not that which what is. Great. Thanks. Thanks. That's philosophy, man. Boom. Closed all the doors there. Didn't he really? Like you, you really you can't even get into that loop in order to no, see no, if it's no, right no, and no. Get it's out. it's it's perfect. It's a yeah. hence his genius. Yeah, okay. So by now he'd published over fifty volumes of stuff, fifty five zero, and the university banned all books that he hadn't written, including even one book that was that appeared was on the rules of basketball. He wasn't a fan. <laughs> They had, Only his own they had one other book, one other book on basketball. And, and well, that's the uh, one that stood out like, what the fuck is this? Seriously, you ban, ban all books that aren't written by, a, like that's a, that's a very. It's the core story. of any really solid committed education. Okay, in fairness, here, here we can go, here we can go with comparison. Even Hitler didn't ban all books not written by him. <laughs> Yeah, it was it Mein Kampf and and how to use a Tommy gun? I I know that I know that Hitler was was not keen on some books, but in general he didn't ban all books not written by Hitler. That's he only wrote one, didn't he? Allegedly, uh, I don't know. I don't know. He, he, we can talk about that later though. Um, so examinations at the university they were verbatim recitations of Lawson's works. Mm. They took years of study. Interim exams were supposed to be held after ten to twenty years. Interim. <laughs> Oh, that's worse than the HSC in New South Wales. Jesus. Isn't it? Isn't it? Congratulations. You're 10 to 20 years into halfway of your course. <laughs> um, and a comprehensive exam after 30 years, <laughs> at which point a passing student would receive the degree of knowledge in. Well, look, okay. It does say that you can't put knowledge in in your email signature now. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, I got one. Have you been Have you been 30 years? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, since I, I was know. 20, I've been studying with Lawson. Yeah, okay. Or well, not with him, because obviously he didn't live to 200. Um, postgraduate work at the University of Lausonomy offered Lawsonian religion did, intended to provide students the highest grade of consciousness. Did anyone get to postgraduate work if you've got to do 30 no, years of undergraduate? They did not. Uh, so he had a, the, the Des Moines University of Lawsonomy at its peak, apparently about 2,000 part-time students. Stop it. Okay. It had 2,000 students. At its peak, 2,000 part-time students. Um, he claimed his theories of physics were discoveries on par with Einstein's theory of relativity. Yeah, you can claim it. So let's let's get into it. Let's let's do a little physics before we close out. Let's do a bit of physics, Lawsonian physics. One, energy does not exist. I recall, um, duh. I, I, Once you hear it, you, you you just can't you can't ever not see that truth. So what do you say when someone says it does, or like there's a fire, or there's something moving, or? Oh, let me talk you through it. All right. So, quote, there is no greater load of misconception 
that science has ever had to shoulder than the unprovable theory that somewhere, somehow, and in some shape, there exists a substance called energy that causes oh, movement. Okay. No such thing exists anywhere, and science should expunge the fallacy without delay. But when you think about it, I mean, I know. there is no substance. He's right. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I know. I know. Just like there are no cars that actually have a beating heart and are alive. Oh, my God. You say what you want. So instead, we, what we actually have, he says, is an eternal battle between substances of varying densities. Okay. These substances, air, other gases. Low density. Solids. Yeah. Liquids. High density. Mentality. Medium density. Mentality. Is that low density yeah. or high density? High density for sure. Heat, cold, light, sound, electricity. The ether of outer space. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sometimes called less ether. I know. It's made of substances that are, quote, supplied directly by the sun in currents of various density and also by solid substances which are drawn into the solar system such as meteors and other cosmic debris which are dissolved into gases by contact with the atmosphere of the earth and a lot of this stems from when lawson was four he made the cunning observation that blowing on dust pushes it away and inhaling it brings it closer so so i had theories when i was four yeah. Um, so, so I wondered, you know, like the tides, why does the tides happen? And I thought maybe, maybe because the day gets hot and yeah. it melts the ice caps and mm. then, the, then nighttime comes and they freeze again. And so the water goes in and, and you know, yes. I, that's a theory. And then I was told that was wrong that, you know, it's the moon yeah. doing that. And there's some evidence. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll change my mind. I, I let go of my no. theory when I was four. See, it's, this is why you're not a success, because a, you didn't stick with it. It's a huge claim to hold on to your four-year-old theories and go, yeah, I was right since I was since then. You should have you stuck with it, man. You should have stuck to your guns, and then we could be talking about you. How did he manage to ever fly a plane? Well, that's just mechanics. Um, it, it seems that this uh, blowing and, and, and inhaling led to the theory that substances of heavy density move towards those with less density. The heavier they move towards less ones, creating two of his, his, his core principles, suction and pressure. There, there is principles, suction. Core and principles. Principle. And we can tell this because things like our, our eyes draw light in by suction. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And gravity is the pull of the Earth's suction. Yeah. So, so, so his, his, his two um, primal, primal forces are suction and... Suction other? and pressure. Flawless. Yeah. So sucking and, and yeah. thrusting. Yeah. Um, so the Earth is surrounded by ether, but the planet is actually made of less ether, less ether, because less ether is less dense than ether. It creates suction through a hole at the North Pole that drags in gases from meteors, etc. Um, okay. These nutrients enter arteries deep in the Earth to be distributed all over the globe and are eventually fired out the Earth's anus at the South Pole. The Earth has an anus. Welcome to the headline that there drew me in. There you go. There you go. The Earth has an anus. I look. Yeah, the Earth has an anus. That's just physics. <laughs> listen, listener. If any of your physics lecturers tell you otherwise, then then they're obviously incorrect. Because demand your money back for that course because it's obviously bollocks. The world is much better when you believe that the Earth has an anus. And it's look, I always have, and I've got to tell you, my world's pretty damn good. So, look, I think I think the thing to remember here, though, this is yet another one of those um, those Eurocentric Northern Hemisphere biases of maps that you I look know. at the top and you go mouth at the yes. top, anus at the bottom, but yes. actually there is no top and bottom in the world. Why? No. Why isn't the anus at the North Pole and yes. the um, the mouth at the bottom pole? I hear you, bro. That could be our new society. Yeah, yeah. Anus at the top. That's where Lawson was wrong. Yeah, idiot. He, he's so yeah Eurocentric. You're right. Speaking of anuses, the body. So air and food are sucked in, rather than eaten. Sucking and pressure ejects the waste. So out. Yeah. So our body's processes are entirely about either suction or pressure. So when those things stop, you die. So I assume that was the fundamental uh, way you got to be two hundred. Sex is the attraction of one sex for another. Lawson said, "It's basically merely the attraction of suction for pressure." Okay. Women are suction and men are uh, pressure. Okay. 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 Uh, I think you can probably do the rest of the maths there on your own. I, I'm happy to talk you through it, but no, women are suction no, and men no, are that's, pressure. That's cool. That's, that's fine. That's fine. When a woman sucks a man very much, the man feels pressured. Uh, this also apparently accounts for magnetism. So if a magnet has more female <laughs> particles than a male, it will have the power of suction. And if the male, if there are more male particles produced, that there's pressure and that pushes the matter away. The thing I love as well is that it's idiot proof. Is, is that they've got these um, these early twentieth century 
um, hyper weird gender ideas as well. And so that, yeah. that layered, layered this dumb physics with a lot of dumb sexism on top of each other. And it's like, uh, well, how do we explain uh, suction? Obviously, it's the woman force and, and, yeah. the, and the man force is pressure. Duh. Can't <sighs> suck with a tube. you got to suck with a hole. Well, you can suck with a tube. <sighs> Just falls over. Um, and in the body, basically, the ideal circumstances, universal substances can achieve a state of maturity called equivarapoise. Equipoise. Equivarapoise. All right, he put a bit of extra in there. Right. Yeah, E-Q-U-A-E-V-E-R-P-O-I-S-E. Lots e of letters. Equivarapoise. You gotta say it in Italian accent. Like it, like it's like uh, which is basically a perpetual movement of matter inside the body. Um, so in but for him it's called Lawson poise. And apparently that's, that's isn't just his body, or is that his theory? Anyone's anyone's okay. that's we all have it. We're all full of a loss Lawson poise. Um it's achieved via the proper combination of diet, hygiene, rest, and exercise, and it can potentially allow a human being to live for two hundred years. What it does no, what? Well, what are we changing here to live to 200 years? He hasn't said what the secret ingredient here is. Like well, you've got to go to the uni, man. You've got to go to the uni and do your half decade exams. Find out and, a bit about Equivator yeah. boys. He's not giving Learn that away. Learn from me as a knowledgerian. So what happens at 200? Why, why at 200 do you suddenly run out of suction? I don't know. Maybe the seals get weak. <laughs> you run out of lubricant. <laughs> Uh, around the seals, nothing weird here, nothing weird. Uh, and the brain, the brain needs more than suction and pressure. So there are apparently two tiny creatures locked in perpetual conflict in the brain. Menorgs. Yes. And disorgs. Menorgs are mental organizers. Uh -huh. Disorgs are the disorganizers and they are like, quote, microscopic vermin. They infect the cells of the mental system and destroy the mental instruments constructed and operated by menorgs. Which and the real thing here, this is going to blow your mind. So get ready, get comfy. Yeah, yeah. A menorg will sacrifice himself for the benefit of the body, but a disorg will sacrifice the body for the benefit of himself. Oh. Whew. Which which one of them is suction? Yes. I don't know if suction or pressure is the creative force. He didn't get into that, that I'm aware. Ah. And he also predicted that basically the worldwide adoption of Lawsonian principles would be complete by the year 2000. And obviously it was. Yeah, well, that, yeah. And after, after that, we clocked it and we don't need it anymore. So we don't need it anymore. We've, we've moved through that. We're post Nolagerian. Listener, if you're born after the year 2000, then um, sorry. The, the world, you know, there was so much Lawsonianism before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now it's just automatic suction and pressure, as we all know. So he, he taught at the university, or the university went on for 10 years until in 1952, a United States Senate's committee, the Senate Small Business Committee, called him forward point of order point of order if i'm if i'm running a, a weird uh cult philosophy university system i don't want to be yeah. brought in by the small bit like surely the large business <laughs> the, the large business committee can bring me to heal I, I'll you insult I'll me take, sir I'll this is that. an enormous business i, I don't want to be i'll have you know at my peak i had two thousand part-time students you fucker exactly i don't want to be brought in by the small business claims tribunal <laughs> <laughs> See that—that's the thing that would get Trump in the end. <laughs> that would—that would really unhinge him if he's brought in by a small claims tribunal. <laughs> Local government got you for parking tickets, <laughs> Um, so they said basically his organization had bought war surplus machines and sold them for a profit, but they—they they had achieved non-profit status, but they were profiteering. You can't do that. So they bought a bunch of machines they from a war surplus facility. Why, why was a university buying a bunch of war surplus machines? To make money in a non-profit organization, okay. standard so, stuff. So he's actually being being an asshole, not just not just a philosophical well, weirdo. You know, he was bending the law in a way that means you weren't abiding by the law that applied to you. Okay. Um, and in Washington, apparently, he went before a panel to claim ignorance, and he it's it's said his attempts to explain lawsonomy to the committee and how it included mechanics proved somewhat confusing. You got to love that though. He walks in, he goes, ha, "Sir, you're here for war profiteering." It really works. Yeah, this is how it actually works, right? Lawsonomy. Sit down, get comfy. I'll get you a drink. Here's what happens. And apparently, as he was leaving the meeting, apparently um, he said, that's the damnedest thing I've ever heard in my life, to which one senator replied, I don't know whether we're talking about the same thing, but I'm inclined to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so the Internal Revenue Service revoked their nonprofit status, which means he owed lots of taxes. Um, he was forced to auction off all the property to a developer who turned the university into a shopping mall. I know it's sad, right? 
Um, the follower was relocated to a farm in Racine, Wisconsin, and that was the only remaining facility, which is basically a shed, it seems. <laughs> Lawson died in 1954, and at the time he died, he was the only person holding the degree of knowledge in. So no one else got one. No one got it. And this is an issue for the existing Lawsonians who wanted to continue the uni because only a Nolegian could give someone the degree of Nolegian. Oh. But he so, died, leaving no others. So there are actually people that tried to follow, but they couldn't. Mm. Oh. Uh, yeah, but so the, the officers of the uni tweaked the laws and they graduated a couple of Nolegians, sorry, Nolegians who were well into their 60s at the time. So bending, they, the rules, bending the rules, though. Bending the rules, seriously. I know, it's fucking dirty, isn't it? Who cares it? what crisis it is? You can't just give out pass marks for nothing. No, no, you can't. You do the work. You put in your 30 years. You mm. memorise those damn texts. So what's left? Um, there's a sign that used to read the, the University of Lawsonomy. It was a, apparently a, a landmark on a, near the Illinois state line for many, many years. And there was a sign on the roof of a building near the freeway that said, um, study natural law. But in, in 2014, it was shingled over. So till 2014, there was some kind of physical evidence of his university well, still. Maybe he paid the bills. He was rich at some period before the war profiting caught up with him. And he thought, I'll pay the bill for 70 years. You know. It's kind of cool. So apparently people would drive past and there was a sign for quite a while. It also said the University of Lawsonomy. Oh, that's that's awesome. kind of funny. Wow. There was a website. So I followed the website. So I found a link in a 2002 article and I clicked on it. And the site exists, but it's basically, a, you know, 1998 Netscape mosaic. So, so there are people like in 1998 uh, still keeping this up? That the site existed when I clicked on it, so it hadn't been um, so someone's hadn't paying been the bills. mothballed. And, and, but, and, and that's done seriously rather than ironically or, uh, uh, yeah, or for historical purposes? No, it seems to be serious, but there's shit all on it. And it basically says, oh, sorry, we're, it's, what is it? The site is now in its infancy. Don't worry, soon there'll be a whole bunch more lasonomy on here. Um, if you want to find something or make a contribution, just mail the webmaster. Yeah, look, look, it takes 30 years to get a degree, 22 years to get the website up. That's not long. I mean, just stop asking Perfectly, for so much. It's, it's within parameters. I agree with you. So I just think it's funny. So I clicked on a, you know, a link that's 20, uh, 18 years old. It still exists. And there's this kind of aspirational, one day we're going to get there. <sighs> so good for them. So getting back to the beginning, you'll remember when I, no, you won't. It's been a long story. But at the beginning, there was the quote about Lawson. So this, of course, the full quote was written by him mm. and it was published in a magazine that he called Man Life. And the full quote is, cool. it seems fitting to end with him. If Lawson should die today, posterity will honour and glorify him as no other mortal because he has given mankind the true base from which to start an edifice of super knowledge of the universe and its laws. <sighs> that is Lawson. That's beautiful. That's better. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, well, there you go. Knowledgearian, edifice of super knowledge. Not even knowledgearian, I got it right. Knowledgearian. Knowledgearian. Didn't even add the Aryan because it makes sense to, and he didn't do that. That's not how he rolled. Oh, my God. Well, there you go. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for uh, for bringing me to the University of Law Sononymy. Yeah, and you thought it was about airlines and baseball. Well, I, I love dirigibles. I, you know, you, you, tempt I don't blame me, you tempt me so much with dirigibles one day. One look, day. they look like a delicious way to travel, except for the slowness. I don't care about slowness. I'm, I, you know, don't with you? COVID, I'm, I'm, I have achieved Zen of not moving. Maybe, maybe. Oh, I maybe. can see you moving right now. For those of you watching or not watching at home, have a little look. Will moved. The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science and Lawsonomy. I'm Will Grant. He's Rod Lamberts. We'll see you next week. We miss you already. 